pew and have a brew, everybody. Hello. We're back for another round of Superfan Chats. I am Superfan Jeremy. Woo. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm Superfan Pip. Woo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Superfan Alice. Woo. Pronouns she, her. Yeah. Welcome back, guys. Yeah, it's. it feels like it's been a while. We've got three very exciting episodes. <gasps> Lordy, have we? Like, my goodness. Uh, this, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get into these. This is, we're doing episodes 82, 83, and 84. Yes. Yeah. Uh, quite a trio. Uh, I will start us off. Okay. With episode 82. Fantastic. So, after filling Orin in on all that had transpired in his absence, uh, the party decided to head onwards, following Gaius's tracking to the mouth of a cave. Gwendolyn used her Wand of Secrets to discover a hidden door with a blood lock and the celestial words, King's Blood, above. And Kidu offered his blood, and the door opened, leading to a series of sticky tunnels. The abyssal sap inside slowly began agitating the party, with Gwendolyn, Orin, and Enkidu all becoming grumpy and annoyed. The tunnels were filled with dunamancy patches and hedrons, and small chambers with more bloodlocks. These activated an illusory Bruth, Bruthus Lister, who questioned the party about their activities to confirm which string they were on, before directing them through further doors. It was during this that Orin revealed that he had witnessed the deaths of Gaius and Juna whilst using the divination table. <sighs> uh, dang, that's... Such an old, that's such a wild, like, that had been so long ago. Um, (laughs) As they progressed through increasingly sticky tunnels, the party realized that holy water could be used to negate the abyssal sap and began using their stock to clear the bloodlocks. Despite this, the agitation grew, with Juna becoming grumpy and Enkidu becoming hostile towards Orin. And after a final angry burst from Enkidu, he reached inside of himself to find Light, who guided him towards drinking the final flask of holy water. With Enkidu's head clear of the agitation, they proceeded into the final chamber, being confronted with the question, tea or coffee? A unanimous answer opened the way into a large hall filled with sofas and a roaring fire. Uh, This episode was wild. It was great. Oh, I loved it so much. Honestly, this is this is one of my favourites. Mm. Um, I loved the gradual grumpiness. It made me <laughs> so. Well, I just I just loved the different ways that they all got grumpy. So I'm really jumping yeah. in. Quite, no, go, no, go, 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 go. But I I I like to be kind of an actor listening to actors. I really loved how gradual like they played it. Like I just thought they really played it true to the characters. Uh, it felt really believable and yep. Daryl particularly waiting until that moment to absolutely lose it on Orin. Like he could have mm. just lost it as soon as David said it, but instead he kind of kept it so that it was. Yeah, he held enough uh, back, right? Yeah, exactly. Didn't just go off immediately. Yeah. Who was, who was your favourite grumpy character? Uh, Orin said twat. It was obviously Orin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to agree that with that. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing Orin say that clearly takes the cake. Yeah. <laughs> and Orin being someone who's so measured so much at the time as well. Yeah. yeah that was, it was delicious. Yeah. I liked it. <laughs> exactly. I, I think that that's just like a really fun... Uh, I guess storytelling element slash mechanic to include because that's not anything obviously like in actual D and D, but the idea that like no, your character is getting real frustrated with everybody. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. it's it's just a, it's a this just causes inter party strife. Yeah. That's the mechanic. It's inter party strife. Uh, that's a really fun. It it works especially with this group because they're all such good actors. Yes. yes. And because they're all they're very focused on collective storytelling. I think if you tried it on like a random group. Your results could be hit or miss, but with these folks, uh, it was a great move. Uh, and once again, just like a very, a very detailed and full feeling dungeon, uh, by yes. Baby David. Yeah. Like, re- from, as, uh, from a DM standpoint, really well put together. Yeah. The gradual, um, increase of the peril of the sap. Uh, was mm-hmm. was so good, like that it gradually turning into basically a flood in the last last bit, bit to last. Yeah, yeah, in the last couple of chambers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I yeah. was going to I was going to ask you Jeremy being the the D&D wizard who knows all because this is the second time we've had like a kind of leveling up of uh either like agitation or like I'm mm-hmm. I'm referring to the the Deacon one where we had like the degrees of being frightened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um is this something that David has just like created that doesn't come up in any kind of D&D handbook at all or has he adapted it from something similar? Have you come across similar before? The closest uh, that I know of in f- terms of a mechanic that is a debuff that keeps getting worse over time is exhaustion, which is course, essentially it happens yeah. if your character does not rest enough or whatever. Yep. But each there are six levels of exhaustion. I'm going to see if I can off the top of my head. The first level, I think, is disadvantage on ability checks, I think. Uh, then second level, let me see, I'm gonna look it up, because I, it's like disadvantage on ability checks, so all, like, skill checks suddenly have disadvantage. Sure. Um, the, I know the big one is, uh, third, third level of exhaustion. That's the one where it's like, oh no, th- this is about to get, this is extremely bad. Yeah, okay, so level, level one is disadvantage on ability checks, second level is speed halved. Mm-hmm. Which is not good, but no. it's not like the worst thing in the world. Third level is disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws. Oh, the saving no. throws is where it gets nasty because if you if if your exhaustion is being caused by a saving throw effect, you now have disadvantage on not getting more exhaustion. On how to fix it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So fourth level uh, hit point maximum is halved, which wow. is. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Fifth level, speed is reduced to zero. Yeah. So now you can't move. You're at half health. <laughs> uh, and you have disadvantage on everything. Wow. And sixth level, you die. Okay. Oh. So I, I don't, it may have been that it, what he did was like inspired by this. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But it was not clearly like, I don't think the mechanical effects were equivalent. Because uh, I, I think we I only got tell. three levels of this, didn't we? Yeah. And yeah. they never, did they ever say like, I can't remember, was it ever like, oh, you can't move as fast anymore? No. I don't, mm, I don't think so. No, it was just how you. It was entirely mood. Yeah. 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 So it was like, hey, we're making a show with a bunch of actors. Let's uh, let's let your actors act. It almost feels yeah. like like a, a a conscious, more of like a show element where like uh, where you might at a t- you might do it at a table full of actors as well. But mm-hmm. if you had a show where you know all your peeps can just act really well, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah might as well showcase that yeah. and actually include it as part of the story. Did you, is there something in Call of Cthulhu like that's fear like the the one that was Insanity? in the Deacon episode? Oh, insanity! All right, okay, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, I've played a little bit of Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I don't know how tightly we stuck to the rules, but yeah, insanity. <laughs> your loss of sanity can cause problems for you. I know another another one is Alien. Uh, I think the Free League publishing games in general, because I know Alien RPG and Walking Dead RPG both have like elements of panic okay. and like sanity that if in, a- in Alien you can have like a panic, if you fail a panic roll or if you have to roll on the panic table, there are different degrees of reaction that you will have to have. Oh, okay. So it'll be like, oh, you drop whatever you're holding or you start freaking out and just screaming <laughs> uh, and other people gain stress <laughs> just from looking at you. It's wild. So, yeah. There's a precedent in other systems, for sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. I feel like there's a precedent in life. I feel like I've (laughs) caused other people to stress based on my level of stress. (laughs) One thing I wanted to highlight uh, that made me, that I was like, oh, I'm glad this finally got some use. Mm -hmm. So... I, I've i been aware of, I've seen the, the item, Wand of Secrets, many, many times oh, in yes. D&D. Uh, it's, it's rarely ever given out, and I've never picked it, because it's not a good item. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it, basically, it is, it has three charges. Mm-hmm. While holding it, you can use an action to expend one of its charges, and if a secret door or trap is within 30 feet of you, the wand pulses and points at the one nearest to you, and it re- regains 1d3 expended charges daily at dawn. My issue with this <laughs> is it's a pitifully short range. It doesn't actually help you open the trap. It just <laughs> points in the direction of the trap yep. and you can only use it three times so you have to it only works when you specifically know that there is a trap nearby mm. but you don't know where the trap or secret door is likely to be 
That's like the only time that it's useful. And I don't know. I just I don't think I've ever like obviously in this case it was it was a good item to it have. It's pretty useful. But it's so situational. Yeah, it's very specific <laughs> set of circumstances. It's so incredibly situational. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a good point. Yeah. It's not like it's not like uh, some of the other items that'll let you like cast detect magic at will or whatever. It's like no no no. You have three chances to find out that there is a trap within thirty feet of you and have an idea of its general direction. I thought it was nice that Gwen got it because as a non magic person, it, it kind of you know it meant that she was really useful there. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a good one. I wonder, I doubt, I doubt he has time. It's a shame. Uh, I doubt he has time. But if in future, if he ever gets time, and you're listening to this, baby David, uh, if you if you are playing more with monks, I highly recommend looking at Baldur's Gate 3, the game, because the, the items for monks in 5th edition are not good. There are not very many good, cool items for monks that let them do fun stuff that are clearly designed to enhance their abilities or whatever. But in the game Baldur's Gate 3, there are a ton of good items for monks that are, like, specifically designed for them. Uh, and some of them are probably kind of game-breaking if you were to put them in an actual campaign. <laughs> but some of them are just like, wow, this is really nice to have. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I highly recommend even just looking up the li- items list. Because – and anyone else out there who's who has is either is a DM or is playing with a, g- a generous DM who might be willing, I, I highly recommend looking at uh, the items – from Baldur's Gate 3 and seeing if you could maybe, if you're playing a monk uh, and have that, because that that would be very cool. Nice. We'll ask you in two episodes time whether any of those items would have been particularly helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. come back to that. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring up that we've now met the illusion of Brufus Lister, which is quite yeah. exciting because that's another, another name that's been hanging around for a long time. One of the founders that uh, we haven't heard too much about other than Something about a lighthouse mysteriously disappearing. Mm. We still don't know that much about him, but yeah, I have I have many questions. He's quite a fun character. I feel like we know that about him. He is, yeah. I know, yeah. I mean, he's got very fetching tights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see more of him. Yeah, me too. I mean, apparently he's mad and or dead, possibly. True, yeah. I mean, the light. we don't know what happened to the lighthouse, do no, we? No, maybe he's in the lighthouse. Yeah, what was what was he hiding in the lighthouse? That is my question. Hmm. Why did it vanish? Did he manage to make a- more tights? Y- yeah, yeah, more that's tights. it. It's just a tights yeah. factory. <laughs> <laughs> He'd stolen a bunch of luxury tights, yeah. and was in hiding with them. But yeah, <laughs> like why why was his why was his illusion here? What ha- what mm. what's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Was that never... actually him, or was that like his spirit? Was it a recording of him? It felt like a recording. Yeah. And how long ago was that kind of set up as well? Yeah, it felt like an Erida kind of gadget, mm. possibly. It was It was very much if they'd asked too many questions, it would have been, you know, restricted to higher ranking family members or something. Yeah, it was, I'm asking the questions, thank you very much, wasn't it? Right. it was yeah, like, exactly. Oh. Yeah, very true. Although he was very, like, positive about not knowing the answers to things. True. You know, I don't know, I'm just an illusion. <laughs> yeah. He was delightful. On all the talk of strings, so is this like basically multiverse theory at this yes. point? We've got a full <laughs> multiverse. You like which which universe, which timeline are you in? Yeah, is that what that Was is? That, has has have strings been mentioned before? Is this the first time they've mentioned it like this? I mean, it's one of those things we've had like all the way through, but it's it's trying to pin down, uh, yeah, all the all the questions, all the hows and whys, and what what yeah. it all yeah. means. I feel like we're we're not really getting closer to an answer. We're just getting closer to lots of potential answers. But then again, yeah. that's kind of how it works, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Have we have we had any kind of time travel like that, except for uh, the divination table? I don't. I don't think so. Not that I can think of. No. No. We could bring up the genomancy thing. Yeah. Then that that does make me think that there was like. Maybe it's just a whole section of the world and the lore that Baby Dan has just had that he just has not employed for the vast majority of this campaign. Because obviously that that divination table sequence is one of the most, you know, one of the most memorable. That's like the point where yeah. people will say, if you're trying out the show for the first time, listen to here. Yeah, get and to if you point. ain't hooked then, then yeah, don't don't bother. But it, like <laughs> But that was that was wild back when it happened, and I it, honestly it didn't occur to me that Orin hadn't even told it people no, like what had happened. Not at all. Yeah, that's like a personal trauma of his. Yeah, 
I, I was sure he had. He had a rough ride in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He really did. Yeah, I'm just like, I, I wonder, do you all think that this will really factor, that the, the different strings and the idea of different timelines potentially will really factor in in the final? Or do you think it's more of just like a fun little, hey, just so you know, there's other timelines and there's people who are aware of this and have like set up things to work with specific timelines? It feels important. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> Will we be jumping? Will the, will a choice be, hey, if you want to save the day, you're going to have to go back to the reality where some of you died? <gasps> oh, God. Oh, Jeremy. Don't do this to me. <laughs> How wild would that be? Oh. I, I Like, hope- sorry, <laughs> there's that. That's the only other reality you have access to. And that's the one where you end up winning in the end. Oh, no. I mean, as, as long as we don't do a kind of Wizard of Oz, it was all a dream and we're going back to episode <laughs> eight. Oh. I think I think no. that would break me. <laughs> you know what? You know what they could do with that. They could do kind of a, uh, a an adventure zone thing where they have like a montage episode where we jump through this alternate reality and see what the party does without those party members. Oh, like how God. how the adventure unfolds so yeah. drastically differently without those characters. How wild would that be? That would be crazy. Would they? I don't know whether they would stay together, like without Juno. Like maybe the whole group would sort of fracture. Uh, I don't know. What happens with the petals as well? Yeah. Like if, oh if Juno yeah. dies, what mm-hmm. happens there? Do they just create another petal to replace her, or is that the end of that? I truly don't know. No. We don't even know which petal she is. No. <laughs> We don't know anything. (laughs) So many questions. (laughs) So many questions. Uh, The uh, another thing uh, is so King's blood. Yes. That the fact that it's okay. First of all, it's written in celestial. Yeah. And it's King's blood. Mm -hmm. Would that have worked with just anybody's blood? Or do we think it needed to be Enkidu's blood? Oh, wouldn't it be nice if they'd done a little experiment? What would the consequence been if they'd trying it and got it wrong? Yeah. Because, I mean, Enkidu has uh, some, I think, some pretty important people inside of him. Is that what is, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder. Having Gilgamesh as one of his patrons. Pat- patrons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His wife is patrons. <laughs> yeah, he subscribes every month. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, go check out the Gilgamesh Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com <laughs> slash <laughs> Inkey. Cheeky little plug. <laughs> Become a patron. Gilgamesh is. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be interested to know what the consequence would be if it did need to be King's Blood and somebody else tried it. Probably a lot more than five hit points being taken, I, yeah, I suspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, maybe I just wasn't fully listening and kind of playing along and just enjoying the episode but i didn't twig when he said some of them have king's blood written and some of them didn't i didn't yeah i didn't think oh well it could be anybody i just sort of went along with it as i guess you would as you're playing it and i didn't make the connection about the holy water either so i would have been a rubbish Mm -hmm. party member in this episode (laughs) (laughs) i feel like you would have been one of the ones who died at the table yeah i I would have been useless I feel like it was Vicky that had all the revelations about the holy water and the king's blood. Yes. She did yes, seem to think spot right. that it was both of those things. So they would have all been stuck with that, Vicky. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And it was yeah. clever with the umbrella and the shields and that to try and sort of protect from the sap. That was all good. Yeah. Good ideas. I, I really enjoyed when it turned into a logic puzzle where they were trying to work out and then David was like, no, it's not a logic puzzle. You can't be anywhere without getting dripped <laughs> yeah, on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is no there is no escape from this. <laughs> no. I didn't plan it that much, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't do that much. <laughs> I kind of want to know whether there was a set number of chambers or whether David just had a massive long list of questions and was just playing until enough of them got agitated. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That would have, yeah. Regardless, uh, I feel like it was very effective. I think, uh, f- yeah, for me, this episode as a whole was just really, really fun. Really, uh, really good performances. Really interesting, just like a dungeon, a really creative dungeon crawl. Yeah. Uh, that like isn't based on combat and stuff. Yep. And uh, lots of, I-, I won't say lore revelations, but lots of lore teases. Like little <laughs> little bits of lore that may or may not be connected to like the main where the story is going, yep. but are really cool and delectable to have there anyway. Yeah, Absolutely. 
and set us up yeah. perfectly for the next episode. Hey! Oh, hey. good segue. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Episode 83, Honest Tastan. So, after navigating through questions and agitating stickiness, they arrived in a sofa-filled lounge where a pot of tea awaited them with a note that read, When asked, present your mask. Around the room were further hedron barriers holding back glimpses into the abyssal realm where a myriad of demonic creatures awaited. Blowing out the roaring fire, Enkidu discovered an illusory wall that led to the living quarters of Geremir Hastan, and Geremir Hastan, and Geremir Hastan. <laughs> a trio of the same founding arcanists awaited, each a different age from the other. With Gaius presenting his mask, they consulted a book, and then decided it was the youngest Hastan who would answer any question the party had. As the party drank tea that removed all agitation, they learned of the founding arcanists' plans to avert a coming disaster centred around a henge that would spell the end of Javain. Part of this plan involved Rumath Tarabor, secluded in a demiplane with a ritual held in his mind, and Light, a Mizoku who could absorb and meld with other beings, as they seemingly had done with Enkidu. As Enkidu tried to understand the revelations, an alarm sounded, and the youngest Hastan left through the illusory wall with Gaius, Gwendolyn, and Juna following. Orin and Enkidu pushed for further answers, but soon joined the others to see the Hedron barriers starting to fail. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I think this is one of my favourite episodes. Oh, really? I think there's there's it, there's been a lot that's been building. Every so often we get these massive lore drops, and I live yeah. for the lore drops. So it's like, I just want all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of lore. We're like little hamsters running over to our little water dispenser, the little lore dispenser. And sometimes it, do it doesn't turn on, but when the little bzzz sounds, we're all like, oh! Like running over. That is exactly what we're like. I remember early on when um, Sam and Hannah T and I were doing our first super fan chats and things, we used to joke that Hannah had a massive board behind her with all the strings and everything going connected together. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there are a lot more connections that have been made after this. Definitely. But I still have so many questions. Yeah. Should we go through some of those, like, some of the big connections that we've had? Oh, no. Yeah, go on. <laughs> oh, my God. I was, I was, I was hoping one of you which I, Where do we was... start? <laughs> oh, wow. Do you think David has, like, a flowchart? Like, we were talking about the questions in the last one. Do you think David has a flowchart of things that they might have done that might have led them to different things? Like, do you think there's a possibility that he has a bit where, like, the middle has done talks to them or the oldest one talks to them first and whether that would have changed anything? Wow. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah, I hadn't even considered that, actually. It may have even been a situation where he just knew what information they could be given and then it just based on other stuff it was like he had an idea of what each of the, the half stands were like yeah and so he just kind of here's what happens and they went with that one it's like all right here we go i mean i think i think my big question is is it significant that there are three of them i mean like i'm not going to skip ahead but we know what happens <laughs> when someone goes through the tear into the abyssal realm and then mm. comes back i'm kind of surprised at that that there were only three like maybe there were more of them hmm. <laughs> at one point why yeah. are they all like we know why they're different ages because trying to get back like they're trying to get back to their own string and it maybe takes them a long time um how much do they tell each other about what they've seen and witnessed and understood do they have different hmm. experiences do they have the same experiences <gasps> and then my head explodes <laughs> Do here's a question: Do either of the other ones, do other the older ones, remember meeting the party? Yeah. Because if yeah. they're completely separate, you know what I mean, then that's fine. But what if there are some realities where all of them, uh, like each of them, were from realities where they'd spoken to the party yeah. at very, you know what I mean? Old Garamir says he's been through this three times. This is the third okay. time he's done this. Okay, so, so maybe this was the same one three separate times. I think so. Yeah, or I think so. <laughs> all of them are fated to go through it three times. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, th I think I know, my other question as well, like, again, maybe I'm just not holding this straight in my head because it's a lot and time stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do they age now? Do they age when they come back? Have they aged? Because time works differently, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. so how, how long ago did those other two occasions happen for Hastan and what has he been doing in the meantime? 
So he's like 200, 600 forgotten. Is it something like that? Like the young one is like 200 and something. I have it written down somewhere, but it might take oh, me a moment nice. to find it. So continue. <laughs> while, while you're looking that up, also the big revelation about light. Oh my like does God. This, is this finally explaining what may have happened? Yes. What, what, what is happening with Enkidu? Yes, we finally know. Yeah. And he's not really an Enkidu. He's sort of light. But light chose to be Enkidu? Yeah, that one's that one's slightly more confusing. I can give you the ages, just to, to, to jump in very quickly while I found them. 210, 356, and the third one, even older, can't really remember, but... Yeah. Oh, wow. 626 was possibly uh, mentioned. nice. So, hundreds wow. of years. Oh, yeah, because it's been about 600 years-ish mm. since Rumor right. died. But yeah, back to light. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, to clarify... <laughs> <laughs> was Light and Kidu from the time that they absorbed the other people, like the patrons, or was that after Enkidu died? Oh, Ooh. no. From when they were when they absorbed them. Okay. So tech So how did that how did the death <laughs> thing work? Yeah. <laughs> there are many unanswered well, questions around this particular moment, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, all we know is that Erida had the sovereign body. And she made that in readiness for the Mazoku to kind of come into the whole thing. Is that right? So it's supposed to have always been like a sovereign body Mazoku cross. I, it might be, yeah. I read it as though both founders were independently working on ways to extend the lifespan slash immortalize whoever the Rumath mind ends up in. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And that it just so happens to have worked out in this particular string <laughs> that Enkidu has ended up being the sovereign model and the one with the patrons. Yes. Yeah. Because it might not have been Enkidu. Like in a different That's sort true. of turn of events, it could have been Juna as the sovereign Juna. model or well, Gwen. Or... Okay, but here's the question though Did Baby David have that aspect planned before the, the event? Or is this a matter of sort of. Because there's no way for, like, we didn't know. Uh, has he just been, like, pulled sort of a Breaking Bad and retconned in elements just sort of seamlessly so that it's like, ha ha, yeah. we played it all along. <laughs> I might have misremembered. I think there was a question on a No Small Questions at one point. I don't think I asked it. I wish it was me that asked it, but I can't remember. It was like, please tell us what happened if one of the other party members had been the ones to die in that in that chamber of electricity. And he was like, well, I had a, I had it mapped out of where the story was going to go for every other party member. Huh. Oh. But they wouldn't tell us what that was. And then, therefore, suggestions of that being bonus content at the end of the campaign. Hopefully, please, baby David. Yes. Do you reckon Light <laughs> would have absorbed someone else? I think that... May- in order to be the sovereign model... Hmm. Ooh, as in, I understand now, as in the Mazoku knew in advance it was going to be Enkidu. Is that what you mean? Uh, no, if if Juno, for example, became the sovereign model, if yeah. she'd been the one that died because she was the closest, mm-hmm. would Enkidu, the Mazoku, have then absorbed Juno as well so that it would have the body? Oh, hmm. Ooh, that's interesting. I don't know. Which would be very weird. It'd be very weird if like Juno became like a patron. Hmm. Yeah, as in like the Mizoku was then going to seek out the Sovereign. Yeah. yeah. I understand. Well, because they're sort of competing entities, right? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been very interesting. I like And if Juna died, how does the pedal thing work? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, God. The pedals. <laughs> All right, so th- there's one element of this that is very reminiscent. I'm wondering if it was a, in a conscious inspiration. It's very reminiscent of Being John Malkovich. Uh, the movie Being John Malkovich, because yeah. that's basically the plot of Being John Malkovich, that all these people get to live, b- theoretically, another lifetime or forever by transporting their souls into a person's body. Yeah. Over, and th- they just keep doing this. Uh, that's that's it's the same kind of idea. Like, yeah, we can live forever by having, but we all get to, in the, in the, of course, in the case of Being John Malkovich, it's like, it's a group that is, has agreed to do this as opposed to like trying to specifically preserve a specific person. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's a very similar premise. I wonder if it was a conscious inspiration. That makes me wish that when Enkidu went inside, when Alcibiades took over, 
like it kind of makes me wish that everyone had just said Enkidu, 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 yes. Enkidu. <laughs> <laughs> Enkidu. How wild would it be if they'd all said light? Oh like, God, what? we didn't know Nerly. Yes. Well, well, we would have also just been baffled. Like, what is <laughs> happening? Why are all these people just saying light? <laughs> and and Enkidu is also stuck saying light. Yes. Like, we're just like, what? <laughs> If you if you don't know what we're referencing, go see Being John Malkovich, everybody. It's a great movie. Great film. Yeah. It's, that's the best scene in the movie as well. Yeah. <laughs> so was Gaius presenting his mask like, do we think that his mask holds significance or is it more of a personal thing? Is there a possibility that Gaius, Gaius' mask is in fact somehow significant to the overall, like it is some sort of an artifact that he's been having on his face that we didn't know? Uh, maybe there's a string where he doesn't have the mask. Hmm. I mean, everything seemed to be stuff acquired along the way, apart from the mask, which he brought with him. So, like, yeah. all the bits mm. of Crow they yeah. picked up on the way. The Rose fan she picked up on the way. Did, yeah. it, did they mention anything else? I don't remember. No, me neither. I do not no. either. No, but it all seemed to be accumulated stuff. It was something specific to a party member pre-joining the party. Yeah. But I can't imagine a string in which Guy didn't have to wear the mask. That would change his whole backstory, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's that there would have been, there could have theoretically been like other party members. Maybe it wasn't just oh. like this specific version of the party member. Maybe it's like in an alternate reality, Gaius never even joined. Yeah. Uh, the you know never even joined the party. These they, it was a completely different group. Whoa, I hadn't even considered that. Or in a different string, Gaius didn't survive episode eight. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. I'm glad we're not on that string. Yes, <laughs> I choose not that reality. I'm I'm still trying to get in my head straight the whole how Kral fits into this and the ritual and Rumaf and all that. Yeah, I That's... think a big part of it is we don't know what the danger is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're, they're all going off their separate ways to try and work out the danger. Yeah. And he drove himself mad, uh, but at some point saw the ritual that he then gave to Rumaf. Yeah. So was it Kral, Kral time jumping was the one who saw the danger in the first place? Is that how they know about the danger? Yes, yes it is, mm -hmm. yes. So I'm I'm wondering in kind of chicken and egg kind of way whether <laughs> Crow hopping saw the danger, hmm. like how many times he hopped and how kind of time sick he was, yeah. um, or yeah. whether the very first time he kind of time hopped, he came back and said, this is the danger and this is what we have to do. I'm going to go try and fix this. I hmm. think Geremir said something about how he'd seen lots of little things that they'd managed to like overcome because he'd mm. seen them in advance. Yeah. But the danger was maybe something he saw later or he saw and just knew that they couldn't beat. Yeah. So then they all split off their different ways to try and find their own ways of beating it, right? Yeah. I I think so. Yeah. This is I'm yeah. Trying to hold it all straight in my head. Yeah. Is I guess, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how kind of together Kral was <laughs> when he came back with the ritual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, no one knows where the, the ritual. Yeah. And where the fixation on the henge came from. Hmm. This all does seem to hinge upon the henges. Yay. Very nice. good. I well, there's one thing I wanted to highlight, which yeah. is the Mazoku uh, is an actual, it's an actual concept. Okay. Uh, separate from the show. And it, it, I twigged it because I'm like, that doesn't sound like a word that they would normally use. Uh -huh. uh, like when they make things, you know what I mean? If they're going to be making things up, I was like, that sounds Asian. Yeah. And yeah. it is. Hey. Uh, they are Japanese. Okay. Uh, in Japanese mythology and fantasy, uh, maz I guess it'd probably be pronounced Mazoku or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, are supernatural beings, normally evil ones, such as devils or demons. Uh, they the The name suggests that they are meant to threaten human existence or defy the gods, uh, the Ma part of the name, while the Zoku part of the name indicates that they are a family. Okay. Uh, and then in mythology and legend, uh, the term Mazoku was used to describe the Asura and Yaksha in Hindu mythology. Oh, wow. Uh, as well as Zoroastrianism's Deva. Uh, it is a general term for devils, demons, and evil beings. Uh, in Japanese polytheism, it is an antonym of Shinzoku, the tribe of gods. 
And then you also have the idea of a Mao, who is a king or ruler over Mazoku. So in, in biblical tra- in Bible translations, Satan is a Mao. I mean, that does make sense, because Geremi's whole thing is demons. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he just got a tame demon? I guess so. Yeah. And then maybe by creating their own family, like, I don't know, sort of kind of absorbed its own family. He's becoming a Mao? Yeah, well, maybe. Because they they have sort of control of all these spirits now. Yeah, I suppose so. But pretty unknowingly, given that they gave it to Enkidu. Yeah, but that would also, that could explain if we're following through the king idea, king of demons or king of spirits, that would follow through with the king's blood idea. That by by absorbing those uh, souls, that that they've kind of become a monarch type figure, a monarch, a monarchical, monarchical figure, monarchical, probably monarchical. Anyway, they become a king. <laughs> yeah. I could be way off in left field right now. No, I'm just, I'm just saying, processing. Gonna, I'm just processing the story. If we try to deep on the mythology. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I don't know. They just seem so benevolent, right? Mm-hmm. It's difficult to think of them sort of wanting to be a king even though that's like their whole purpose through Gilgamesh. I th- I could, I don't, it may not be, well, okay. Do we think that light wants to absorb? Like, do we think that light likes doing it, like fulfilling their purpose? I mean, they don't seem unhappy in Enkidu's head. No, true. Um, I got the impression that the, the explanation for the, the six year memory gap was that maybe if it was the first time that light had absorbed before and had absorbed that many beings that that accounted for the memory loss thing so maybe yeah they didn't really know what they were doing yeah mm. maybe which it's would still to be decided make sense of our asbiades being yeah there. yeah yeah it's almost that like it was feel like an accident yeah i yeah, yeah they were going for enkidu but the rest of them were he was surrounded at the time and to try and save him so that he didn't die so the plan could kind of carry on yeah is they were kind of forced to take in everybody else within that sort of sphere. Little group, yeah. Took more than they bargained for. <laughs> you know, I was, I was just looking at, okay, so this is this is a deeper cut, but Ooh. it might, because I don't know how much of this was come up with by Daryl as well. I'm going to be very clear. Yeah. But Daryl does martial arts. Yep. Uh, Daryl is a black man. And as a black man, I know that many black men are into anime. And Light happens to be the name of one of the most famous anime protagonist, uh, protagonists of all time. Light Yagami, the protagonist of the series Death Note. Okay. Uh, who is not a good guy, but also... Looking at here, uh, one of, so a, uh, the idea that Mao can be a king of the Mazoku... There is a an even more famous character, Piccolo, from Dragon Ball, uh, is also considered a Mao. Uh, Piccolo is, if you're not familiar with Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z, basically one of the he's a he's a green he's a green alien guy. He's a cool green alien guy who starts out as an evil guy, uh, who's who's call, they call him the Demon King, evil Demon King Piccolo, but then he becomes a good guy and ends up. Uh, you know, helping people and mm. being kind of a father figure to one of the major characters. Uh, but he also is famously considered by most black people to be a black guy. Uh, this is this is very very common. It's just some, it's a common thing for black people to when we watch and uh, uh, media that does not have black people represented. Yeah. Uh, but there are people who are not like who don't fit into an easy racial category. Uh, we may identify with some of them and think that person's black. Piccolo, one of the most famous examples of this, if not the most famous example of a black non black character. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying, if in fact, uh, if in fact that was, if, if Daryl was sitting down reading about Japanese mythology and was like, yo, Piccolo as a demon king, I can make this cool dude who's got like souls trapped in him. I, I'm just wondering. I don't know. I'm just, that's, that's my logic. I don't, Daryl, if you listen to this and I'm correct, let me know. Yeah. Uh, if I'm way off base, then, hey, you have a character who technically may fit into the same category as Piccolo. Yeah, cool I'd love that? to know, actually. Yeah, I'd really, I'd be really would interested love to know. know. Yeah. He did seem genuinely surprised when he found out about Light. True. But that could have just been acting. 
Hey, that's that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Oh God! Could you get through eighty-three episodes and and just be like, well, I knew this the whole time, but yeah. Enkidu didn't. So I've just been. That's that'd be amazing. Do we have any else? Anything else we want to say about this? I mean, one? there's there's a lot in this episode. Good lord! Oh, so. Uh, I don't. I can't remember whether I've mentioned this before, but there's something about a prophecy and people going all out to try and prevent it. It does feel like all the evil people are those people who are trying to prevent it. Hmm. We've got Chargel being, you know, taking over other people's brains, mm-hmm. and you know, it's just Erida is terrifying, and Geremir Hassan is the most benign of all of them mm-hmm. and he's actually given us information which is nice but it's like it does sort of feel like maybe they saw the prophecy like in Greek mythology and then they're making it happen so by doing all this research they're actually bringing along bringing about the disaster oh okay is that a possibility as in if they'd just shut the book and left it alone none of this would happen <laughs> yeah wow pretty much because, I mean, Rumath Terraborn has been gladly making his descendants mad for 600 years. None of them are good people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they are all pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> that is interesting, the idea that the, the people prevent it, like the prophecy, like it needs to happen, maybe. Yeah, or maybe. Happen. Yeah. Or is the idea that trying to prevent fate, uh, trying to prevent the inevitable, is, is it like a theme? Is it like the idea that pre- trying to prevent the inevitable is bad mm. and that you should try to live with the world and the way that things are supposed to go rather than try and control it? Maybe, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm wondering I whether I'm now visualizing string <laughs> and whether <laughs> <laughs> and how you would visually lay out string and whether you have like the party in the middle. I'm doing hand gestures and I realize this doesn't work, but... <laughs> Where we have like the party as a central point and lots of strings spreading outwards from them and whether they're the focus or whether it's kind of like almost almost like you've got like a bundle of, of wires and then there are fixed points that keep these strings vaguely locked in the right place, but then they branch out and then there's another kind of point of thing, like a, a certainty, a thing that has to happen that everything then kind of reconvenes around there's a few different ways you could kind of visualize this cycle of strings, you know, calling it a cycle almost sort of envisages that there has to be like a beginning and an end, but the beginning isn't really the beginning and the end isn't the end. And maybe there's like a, almost like a reset point and maybe this disaster is the reset point. Yeah, that's interesting. Could be. Don't know. Sort of like the Big Bang, the idea that like yeah. the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, Big yeah. Bang may have been caused by the universe to... snapping in on itself. And then exploding back out, and then the, yeah. the universe is expanding again, and then it'll snap back in on itself. Yeah. So maybe the disaster is the creation of Dravain and the destruction of Dravain all in one somehow. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. And it would make sense, like with the henges being like a natural form of all the magics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That that's why they're the focal point is because they're actually the I don't know the building stones of Dravain or something. Hmm. Baby David, uh, could you could you just come on to the call real quick? We have, we just have a few quick questions. Wouldn't it be amazing if you just oh. did and told us everything? Could you just email us yeah. all of your notes? End of campaign. Yeah, could you just email Super us? Super fan chat. Just we transfer. Send us a we transfer link yeah. to all of your notes. Please. We need so David we may simply read them in aloud. In the final Super fan chat, just answering all of our questions. <laughs> We're just sitting there reading his notes. We're not even yeah. we're just <laughs> yeah. like, all right, uh, just going from the very beginning. Yep. Yeah. Shall I um? Shall I move on to the third and final episode? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be more, but yeah, let's go with episode eighty-four. Episode eighty-four is demonic disruption. So, with tears opening into the abyssal realm, the party prepared to defend themselves as the youngest Hastan conjured new hedrons to fix the barriers. Luring lights from the abyss pulled them all forwards, and wretches leapt out to attack Orin. Juna closed her eyes to avoid the lights, deciding to look through Ruana's eyes instead. With a winged demon stepping through, Gaius polymorphed it into a turtle and hurtled it through the tear. But as luring lights caught his gaze, he stepped through, followed swiftly by Enkidu's summoned Shadowspawn and Gwendolyn. 
resulting in a kaleidoscope of Gwen and Gaius's all stepping through from different strings. A number of Gaius's teleported back through the tear just before the youngest Hastan jumped through and sealed it shut, barring Gwendolyn's rescue. As the middle-aged Hastan stepped up to seal the other tears, grasping tentacles pulled some of the Gaius duplicates out. And as the oldest Hastan arrived, the mid-aged Hastan launched himself through another tear and sealed them all shut. <sighs> what a trio of episodes. Right? This is the cliffhanger of all cliffhangers, right? It's oh, <laughs> trapping yeah, Gwendolyn in, in the Abyssal Realm. And Cal. I'm, I'm surprisingly worried yes. about Cal. Yeah. Given that we only see him like once every 15 episodes or something. Like, I really like <laughs> Cal. Yeah. I know. I, I can't envisage a way for them to easily fix this. I think that's my worry. Oh, no. Maybe they got to get a different Gwendolyn. No! Ooh. I like this one. They got to get a replacement. No! Oh, no. <laughs> how do we even know that, like, the guy, like, how do we know which one we have? What if there are so many similarities? Like, what happens? Because if it's like, if we're saying that every, we don't know how many different permutations exist, but if it's an actual multiversal thing where like every single possible permutation exists, yep. that means that there are probably an infinite number of Gwendolyns who have such minuscule differences uh -huh. from the original Gwendolyn that you wouldn't be able to tell unless you were to go through, comb through every moment of their life <laughs> and see like, oh, this is the only, like, oh, in this one, she had one less drink that one night wow. and kissed <laughs> one less person. Yep. That's like the, that's like the only difference. Uh, and it's like, but you find out like, oh, this is actually not the same Gwendolyn. Is that not the same Gwendolyn anymore? Like what is, is the, how ship of Theseus do we want to get with this? <laughs> the ship of Gwendolyn. How many, how many, how, at what point does it stop being our Gwen? Blows my mind. Well, I, I hope we don't have to unbuild her and then rebuild her in order to actually know. <laughs> of all new parts. Yeah. <laughs> She's, she looks and sounds and has all the same memories, but is completely made of different, of different pieces. I find it interesting that... Again, I'm going to go back to this, there being three Hastans thing, mm -hmm. is I find it ha interesting and concerning how um, he said to Orin, don't let them back through, which I can see, I can see why, because you wouldn't want hundreds of them coming back in, because then that is another huge thing to tidy up. But at the same time, you know, he came back through. So what's the yeah. story there? That's kind of what makes me wonder if it's a different... If it's a different Hastan. It is it is weird they're all different ages. Given yeah. that as they go through, they go through and they're the same age, like there's not very much different. Yeah. It makes me and and, and also that the Hastans, at least one of them, I think, stepped through with the Hedron in order to seal the tear. Yes. Maybe there were hundreds of them at one point and they've had to do this and that's why so many of them, they almost like one of them steps through and then lets ten of them back, and then every time the Hedron's disintegrate and these things come through then they try and fix it again and then the only way is to send more of himself back through to fix it and there's this kind of cycle yeah i can't work out how david's done it <laughs> yeah i can't deal with time times no. and multi-dimensions <laughs> yeah because it's not just time travel it's dimensional yeah it's yeah. different timelines and dimensions so yeah i'm wondering if after Avengers Endgame, I had to get my friend to sit down and explain some of the time stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you ever watch uh, Spider-Man No Way Home? Yeah. That one's even more confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where the, all the different villains start coming in from different timelines and stuff. Yeah. And a similar yeah. thing with Loki as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All the variants. Oh, man. Uh, I love those kinds of stories, but now I'm like, we don't know at any yeah. point. Uh, the whole party could have been replaced. Any party member could have been replaced. Uh, that's, yeah. It's... Yeah. The, the, um, the, I, I find multiverse stuff so much easier but as soon as time gets involved, and then I'm absolutely, I've got no idea what's going on. Yeah. Like multiverse, yes, this makes complete sense. <laughs> time, no, no. Yeah. Different strings of time, absolutely no sense to me at all. Yeah, mixing them together is, is yeah, just mind-blowing. <laughs> okay, so here's a question then. Yeah. Do, so if, assuming that they are all the same uh, Garamir Hastan, mm -hmm. uh, they've all had or at least they're close enough that they've all kind of had the same experiences. Mm -hmm. Like the old one, 
did the old one say don't let them back through because he already did this and he knows that they don't come back oh. through? Because if he's already done it, then it's like, hey, they don't come through. Don't try and let them. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I've been here and you don't try and let them and you don't succeed. Like this, this is what happens. This is the path you're on. Maybe. But then he does always also give them hope, doesn't he? Well, it may just because there may be more that happens down the line. We don't know that there's never going to be any more tears. We don't know what's going to happen. It could just be like, this is the path that you're on. Jumping back to Avengers, yeah. there's only one way through this. Yeah. You have to let this happen because the uh, the the only way to stop this is through this specific path. And it could be like, mm. look, I know the string you're on for the fate that you guys, the the fate that you all are marked for. Uh, this is the way you have to go. You don't let them back through. Oh, maybe. Oh no. I'll tell you what would be fascinating, and I'm completely it's just complete conjecture, but is. How fascinating would it be if we managed to get Gwen back at some point, reasonably soon, but, and it's the right Gwen, but she's a lot older or a lot <gasps> younger. Oh, no. Oh, no, she can be I, younger. I think she'd have to be older because if she was younger, surely she would remember, right? Gwen doesn't have any big gaps in her memory, does she? That's true, actually. No. So, yeah, what if she's a lot older? You know who would? In Kidu. Just saying. Uh, like if they got like the Enkidu from that six year span, if they were to somehow get that guy, and that's like why he doesn't. And that's actually why he doesn't remember is because he went through on an adventure with them, forgot about it, and then met them again later. How wild would that be? Maybe maybe, maybe Cal was in charge for those six years, and that's why he doesn't remember because <laughs> it, ha- it hasn't happened yet. Whoa! That would be wild. Yeah, I I do actually really like the idea of them meeting a Gwendolyn who has like ex- experienced other stuff and is yep. just older now. I would I don't know as as Dwayne. I'm not <laughs> like I don't want her to I don't want her to like suddenly be like she's just elderly. I don't think Dwayne I mean, would have a problem with it, I but mean, I think he'd feel bad because he's like there's all these years we could have had. Dwayne's together. a dragon. Oh. Like how old is he? <laughs> Uh, Dwayne, Dwayne is significantly older than Gwendolyn, well, but uh, he's, just it's up. not the, yeah, I don't think the age, the, the, the years is not the issue. It's the mileage. Yeah, sure. Uh, he would be like, but you only have this many years left and all these years we never got to spend together. But then it turns oh, out like she was oh, with, that's heartbreaking. she was with a different Dwayne, uh, in another reality oh. or something. Oh, oh, maybe that's why he started off as an elf and he then became a halfling. <laughs> 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 I'm joking. Oops. No. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like, Gwen is Gwen is the... I mean, she's not naive, but she's one of the younger ones with less life experience. Mm. So that mm. would be a really, really interesting dynamic to bring in an older Gwen. Yeah. I would worry about her having aged within the abyssal plane, though, because that would make a very different sort of person. True. She'd be like... It'd be the Jumanji. She's like, oh, oh, she's got like wild hair. She's just like, yes. she's like Sarah Connor from Terminator 2. She's like hard, hardcore, just like so stoic and serious. Oh man, I would hate that. Oh my goodness, this has given me so many things to think about now. I'm one, well, and the, here's the thing. Just because she went to the Abyssal Plane doesn't mean she's, st- say we meet her and it's been 40 years for her. We don't know that she stayed there for 40 years. There are tears. There have been mm. tears. There will be tears. She could have gotten out and then come back through it at some point. Yeah. Maybe there's going to be a whole like side, like we did for Oren. Maybe there'll be a whole side adventure where we find it, find out what like Gwendolyn was doing and see, find out she's lived like a whole life. Yeah. Has Grace been doing a show in America at any point? <laughs> no. She went on a vacation recently, but I don't think that was, I don't think that was what that was. Maybe she comes back as a different character. Maybe Gwendolyn's just gone for a while oh. and Grace comes back as a completely different, like one of the Ooh. NPCs that we've never met but we've heard about. Ooh. That would be cool. Yeah. I mean, I want, I want Gwen back, don't get me wrong, but that, that would yes, be cool. I, I also really want Gwen back. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, uh, I will, I'm pro Gwen returning, but I think it might be like a fun, <laughs> sort of like a, uh, as since, especially cause, uh, a lot of the cast are like critical role fans, uh, mm-hmm. for them to, for them to do like a Terry and Darrington situation where it's like sam in in critical role campaign one for those of you who don't know uh there was a point in the story where sam regal's character 
uh, um, his character basically had a falling out with the party and I think wanted to go and help and be with his daughter. Uh, he, cause he just hadn't led like a really good life and wanted to go and reconnect with his estranged daughter. Yeah. And he brought a different character named Terry and Darrington. If you've ever heard of <laughs> Darrington Press, that's who that's named after. Uh, Ter- an artificer named Ter- Terry and Darrington came and joined the party for a while and then eventually left and Sam's original character came back. But it could be one of those. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's Yeah, really and cool. it was towards, it was in the last, I think it was in the back half of the campaign as well. I mean, I could see Grace having a lot of fun with that. Maybe she brings her scientist character from the Dwayne, from <gasps> oh, the that Dwayne would be cool. uh, miniseries. <laughs> oh, yeah, she was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do either of you have any good ideas about how on earth we figure out which Gaius is the, quote, right Gaius? <sighs> do you know what? I don't. I don't mind. I'd be quite happy with Haiku Guy. I mean, obviously, I love original (laughs) flavor, but Haiku Guy was great. Surprising British one was great. Southern Guy was great. (laughs) We're always going to have fun. Chris was having so much fun with, like, doing Across the Spider-Verse with that. He was just having Mm -hmm. the funnest time. It was delightful to listen to. It was great. It was really great. (laughs) Yeah. I wonder whether, I mean... I guess game wise, they can't all stay because it would be ridiculous trying to play so many Gaiuses. But I wonder if they did stick around for a while and they tried to leave the kind of cave chamber system, yeah. whether the further away they got from the tears and the the longer they stuck around in the kind of the string and the timeline that wasn't theirs, I wonder whether that would, what kind of effect or consequence that would have ultimately as well. What do you think? They might either cease to exist or just, you know, tear the fabric of the universe like more. Yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly what I was wondering. Like, what happens if they just decide to spread out into the world? Yeah. And there's they can just run into like, you know, Southern guy who's running a saloon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, you know, ten episodes from now. <laughs> just like, oh, hey there. <laughs> just like polishing some polishing some gl- uh, some glasses. Uh, that would be pretty fun. Yeah, I think a sitcom where five guys who are not our guy live five together. Five guys! Five guys! That's the name! <laughs> <laughs> See, Done. this writes itself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Side quest. <laughs> yes. Oh, that would be great. And Chris has to play all of them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would, lo- I would love that. That would be incredible. And in the corner, there's just a little Lego one just to keep him happy. Mm-hmm. Like, a little Lego guy. <laughs> yep. A little Lego guy. That's great. Yeah, I think that's wow. awesome. I mean, could could that be the catastrophe? What, more than one guy? Yeah, or just... <laughs> but just having that many... And assuming that they let some Gwendolyn's back somehow as well, and or some oh, Shadow Spawns back, whether right. that's kind oh, of too much for that particular universe to cope with. Yeah. I thought you just meant having lots of guys around. Yeah, no, no. Be a <laughs> I mean that would be de- that would be delightful. <laughs> Do we think those other Enkidus are also lights? Are those other Enkidus also lights? Are those other Enkidus also? Are they also? Uh, oh. Have they also been um, arided? Have they been fused? How many of those Enkidus are fused? How many? Like that's a good question, actually. How many of those alternate people were the ones who died and have been fused with the body? Right. Yeah. Like, could they have gotten other versions of it and brought it through? How wh- how would that affect things to be like, hey, now we have more than one? Because if there's alternate, because if these are alternate parallel, if there's if these universes are similar enough, there might be a number of them. I mean, there would theoretically be an infinite number of them in which other people died and became um, the uh, what's the name of the body? What's the oh the sovereign model? Yeah, the sovereign model. Yeah, what if there's an infinite number of sovereign models theoretically, and it's possible that one of them is cur- one of the guys could be a sovereign model. Oh, oh well, they're the ones that's come through is a sovereign model. You mean possibly? We don't know if none of those guys got if none of those guys died. Yeah, that is so possible. They do need to have a chat with them before they just get rid of them all. Yeah. I'm I'm imagining like the idea that like this really fun scene and baby David is like sending Chris mountains of lore. <laughs> it's like, okay, so you pick, but one of these guys has all of this. <laughs> and there's a there's another big ethical conundrum for the party as well, is that you know, assuming they do figure out which guy is their guy from their timeline and their string, 
what do you do with the rest of them? Yeah. Because, you know, they've, they've, they've sealed the portal. Oh, God, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah, because yeah. the tentacles kind of made things a bit easier by taking some of them off. But Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't the open it again. And seal- but they've, yeah. they've still got them. What was the deal they've, with that? They've still got amputated tentacles in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the tentacles as well. See what they want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so is this a beast that you know about? A winged tentacled demon? I mean, it sounds like Cthulhu. Does he have wings? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Cthulhu has tentacles on his face and then wings on his back. And then I think he has four legs. I'm trying to think if there's... I'm going to look up a list of... I'm guessing this is an aberration. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up... I presume this is a high-level aberration as well. This does not seem like some, like, CR2... Uh, some CR2 <laughs> monster. Yeah, he was hitting them with some high-powered monsters. Like, yeah. Brian was terrifying. It was really good that guy turned him into a turtle. Really scary! Yeah. That was uh, Baylor. I looked up the stats. Oh, Horrendous. yeah. Yeah, Baylors are no joke. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because okay. he got a plus 14 to hit, which explains why uh, he got 27 damage on that one. Yeah. <laughs> that was really scary. I'm just going to I'm just gonna start looking through. I wonder if... Uh, so, what's Gargantua? I need to see the art for these uh, to see if they fit. With what uh, Baby David is describing. Nope, not a gargantua. <laughs> um, otherworldly corruptor. Ooh. Uh, that's, that sounds intriguing. What's an otherworldly corruptor? Uh, it sounds sort of beholdery, like it gets in your brain. This does. Ha- okay, so the otherworldly corruptor is, is medium or small, so I don't think that would fit, even though it does have um, tentacles. Uh, cosmic horror, that Ooh. could potentially be okay. one. Let me see. Oh, it's got tentacles. Hey. Okay. It's got tentacles. It's Does a it gargantuan aberration. Uh, CR 17, I think. CR 18. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's got multiple tentacles. Uh, it has a bite. It has psychic powers. Maybe it was the cosmic horror. Or it could be, I, I, I forget what a star spawn looks like. Let me see if I can find what the greater star spawn looks like. Because a lot of aberrations have tentacles, to be honest. <laughs> uh, it could be a greater, it could be a greater star spawn emissary potentially, or some kind of star spawn related thing. Yeah, but I, I'm going to say cosmic horror. I could believe that. I could see star spawn. Uh, probably not an elder brain dragon. It, it, no, it didn't feel very dragony. Yeah, or elder brainy for that matter. <laughs> but yeah, that's wild. Oh man, what a this is like. I, d- I remember I was hanging out with with Grace and and Daryl uh, back in February, uh-huh. and there was they were saying like because I had said to Grace previously like man I'm not sure how you guys are gonna wrap this up by like a hundred episodes or so like w- w- how are you gonna do this uh, and she was like oh no things kick into gear and then I was like <laughs> talking to both her and Daryl and they were like yeah. They were just like thousand yard stairs. They were like, man, <laughs> stuff we happens. Some things. <laughs> and it's coming up soon. <laughs> I was like, oh. Well, they kept talking about a heat wave. So this clearly happened last summer. This was not recent that they filmed, that they recorded. True, yeah. yeah. So. True. So, so maybe, maybe things haven't even kicked into gear. No. <laughs> maybe well, this isn't ooh. even it. We just sort of feel like we're getting funneled now. Yeah. Towards an end game kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do um do either of you have any favourite moments or wild theories that you want to just chuck out towards the end quickly? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of favourite moments. I mean, over <laughs> all three episodes, an absolute truck of favourite moments. Yeah. Okay. Narrowing it down to one is tricky. I did enjoy David being deeply gleeful about every time he was like, and now it's the demon's turn. And he was so happy about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he does that well. He does that very well. Invasion, invasion, invasion was something I wrote down. (laughs) Invasion. (laughs) Jeremy, do you have anything? I... Ah, the whole dang thing's a favorite moment. This is one of the best, I think, trio uh, trios of episodes. Oh, that absolutely. We've done. Yeah. Like, I don't know that there's another trio where pe- multiple people have been like, I think this is one of my favorite episodes. Like, <laughs> for different episodes. Yeah, yeah. That's it, yeah. I think I think we've hit a real corker, uh, a real trio of corkers here. Uh, and so I would say the, just the whole thing. 
Uh, and it's cool to get all these lore drops, cool to get all this, these little strings of lore, b- yeah. pun intended. Um, <laughs> there, yeah, and I can't wait to yep. see where it goes. I really, I, in terms of where I predict, I predict that it will be emotionally affecting and will end in a way that probably none of us really predicted because yep, none sure. of us are sure exactly what's happening. So <laughs> it, is, it is extremely difficult to predict because yeah, none of us, wrong. including the party, no one actually knows. <laughs> like we, you know what I mean? Like in most d d campaigns or at least in a lot of them there's a point at which and a lot of stories like this as well there's a point at which the characters go oh okay this is what we need to do and you know you gear up for the final thing yeah we're not there we haven't it's been 80 something episodes and we have no i have no idea (laughs) what that is absolutely nothing (laughs) what the end game would actually be so i i don't know (laughs) it's probably gonna be good it's probably gonna be really good i just don't know (laughs) <laughs> I think mine I mean as as much as I I loved the ridiculous amount of lore drops and I can't possibly pick one particular little moment of lore I think the turning of the the demon into a turtle yeah I think if that hadn't happened that whole sequence would have gone so so much worse I don't see them I need to look at the Baylor stats I don't think they win that fight no I don't think so it's no, terrifying. that's what I mean. It's like, I, yeah, as soon as that happened, I went, oh, shit. Yeah. I literally don't know how they're going to deal with this. And the fact as well, he had to do the role and the role just happened to be really low. And yeah. the fact that it worked, if it hadn't worked, I dread oh, to yeah. think what would have happened. Baylor's are CR 19. Yeah. They have, they have, I mean, assuming that, that baby David was using just the average HP, there's 262 hit points. <laughs> Uh, resistant <laughs> to cold, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks, immune to fire and poison. They have they see so uh, what is it? A wisdom saving throw? I think it's a wisdom mm-hmm. saving throw for polymorph. Mm-hmm. That's a plus nine. They have a plus <laughs> nine for that. Uh, and even when it dies, even if they had managed to kill it, when the Baylor dies, it explodes, and everybody within 30 feet of it has to make a DC 20 deck save, oh. taking 20 D6 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. The only one who would have likely survived that was Gwendolyn, uh, wow. and that's if she had succeeded, because then if she succeeded, she would have taken no damage. Uh, and yeah, it's they, they, they have, of course, the fire aura. Everybody within te- five feet takes yeah. 3d6 fire damage. Like, oh. it's just not, what are you supposed to do? If you yeah. hit it with a melee attack, which a significant, like, Gwendolyn is a bread and butter melee. And Kidu, I mean, he's, a lot of his stuff is melee. You take 3d6 fire damage. It, it has, it. not only that, it has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. So they got really lucky with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, plus 14 to hit. Does... Looks like six d eight plus eight fire uh, or damage <laughs> with each hit. It's like, ludicrous. Yeah, and it can teleport. Like, <laughs> it's, oh it's, no! This is not like a really high. This is not. This has never been a really high offense party to begin with. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I don't know if they win that fight. Like, it can. It's. It can. Theor- it could conceivably out damage the entire party. Yeah. Uh, and, and once people started going down, especially cause the party has like maybe one ish dedicated healer in Gaius. Yeah. Once he goes down, that's about it. That's all she wrote. Like, what are they going to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All it needs to do is stand next to him and it, he, he'll just keep going down unless somebody grabs him, yeah. tries to run away with him <laughs> and incurs an opportunity. <laughs> attack. Like they, yeah, that's whew. Yeah. Polymorph has been a really lucky spell for them. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, that was a good moment. Well, that and the slug moment. I think I I enjoy yeah. this polymorph yeah. moments. I really enjoy when they the work, slug. and especially when they yeah they turn the tide of of the battle. Absolutely, yeah, Absolutely. that's my favorite moment. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, one of the best spells in D anD D, for sure. I mean, we're not going to argue with you. You are the D anD D guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just the it's the amount of versatility. Uh, have they ever? They, I don't think they've ever used the T. Have they used the T Rex strategy? No. <laughs> There's a, one of the most uh, common, uh, and I don't know if they if they have access to it with this, but one of the most common uses of polymorph is to polymorph, especially if you're higher level, is to polymorph a party member into a T-Rex and then just have them attack your enemies. Uh, 
Oh, I hope they do this in the future. Yeah, I, I for, I'd have to look at the rules for what I, I think it's usually it's something you have to have seen before. But oh, and, I, okay. there's a and there's a there's a limit to what CR you can do. But what are they? Are they level ten? Are they tenth level right now? I feel like they might be around higher. about. Yeah. Yeah, they're having... like level ten or eleven, I think. Yeah. Um, it said, yeah, you can transform them. It challenge ratings equal to le- equal to or less than the targets, uh, than the targets level. Okay. Okay. So they're level ten, I think. Let me look at the ty- Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can imagine Orin maybe having seen it in a library at some point. You never know. In a book, yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, it's CR8. They could turn somebody into T Rex. They could turn T Rex has 136 it. hit points. Whoa. Uh, it can attack. Tw- it can attack twice. It has a plus 10 to hit with its bite and does four D10 piercing damage. <laughs> uh, and it auto grapples people uh, hey. when, when it bites them. Like it's just a really good. If you just want somebody to cause mayhem uh, oh. and become a damage sponge and a damage dealer, uh, it's really really useful. I would love to see a Juna T Rex. Yes. <laughs> Still with the tattoos. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that would look so great. Like tattoos in yeah. scales. Oh, that would yeah. be awesome. Well, or maybe feathers. And if they did like a feathered one, it could be yeah. like petals. Yes. Oh, that would be great. Can we manifest this? I don't know how we can do it if they've already recorded. <laughs> well, they haven't finished the series. You never oh. know. We can Maybe we can send them a, a message being request. like, hey. So I don't know if y'all have discussed the T-Rex thing, but if you haven't done it yet, this could be a really fun finale thing to like yes. drop a T-Rex on somebody at the beginning of a combat. I mean, may- maybe, maybe the T-Rex is the disaster that's coming. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, no. <laughs> they summon a T-Rex and it eats the king. It eats the air. The T-Rex eats the air to the king. <laughs> And they're like, we have to preserve. And that's why they create, li- like, somebody goes back in time and creates life. They're like, we have to be able to preserve souls. Uh, <laughs> we can't let this happen. Wow. Well, is it probably more for like an hour? So it's a real hours, hour long disaster. And then yeah. Done. Yeah. Oh, but you I mean, can if do, they, you can if do if a lot of damage eaten, in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. They're already, be. <laughs> they're like, the person, they'll still be in there, I guess. <laughs> just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just getting digested. It'll just be a real, like, a. it'll be a Juna with a very big belly uh, digesting <laughs> some important pair person. Just chilling out, like, wow, I feel full. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we wrap this up? Yeah, we've broken the story. That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening for another uh, super fan chat. And thank you once again to the to the cast, uh, and the ma- the makers of this show, because yeah. y'all are making a really great show. Uh, and you're giving us you're giving us absolute gold uh, yeah. episode after episode. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for tuning in, and we'll, we'll see you next time for another super fan chat. We will. What's the sign off for this? Ah, yeah. Oh. Uh, no, no, no. 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 Hey.